Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we have two speakers presenting in our uh, webinar. We have Jim Griffin and Alan Rio Palacio. Uh, Jim is a professor in the Department of Statistical Science, uh, University College London. His contributions have focused on Bayesian on parametric methods, regression modeling with high dimensional data, time series modeling in econometrics and finance. Uh, Alan is a researcher in the Statistics and Probability Department at the Institute of Applied Mathematics, Universidad, Universidad Autónoma de Mexico. His research interests include a Bayesian non-parametric statistics, inference of stochastic processes, and simulation methods. The topic of their talk today is survival regression models with dependent Bayesian non-parametric priors. Uh, please recall that you can ask clarification questions during the presentation. However, we ask you to hold all non-clarification questions until the end of the presentation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jim and Alan. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so what I want to talk, to do, talk about today is a new uh, survival regression model that's based around uh, neutral to the right models. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with Alan and with uh, Fabrizio Lyson, who's at Nottingham. Uh, and so we did all this work when, uh, when we were at Kent and when Alan was uh, our PhD student. Okay, so just to give you an outline of the talk, uh, what I'm gonna do is to give a kind of introduction. Um, so when I gave this talk in, in Newcastle in the UK, uh, they asked me to give a kind of introduction for that was suitable for uh, kind of PhD students. So I thought that was quite useful. Uh, and I've kept that kind of uh, some general background, not, not too much. Then we'll kind of go into some background on Bayesian non-parametrics. I guess I'll be able to, to move through that fairly swiftly uh, with this audience. And then we'll look at this, uh, this new model that we're proposing for survival analysis. Uh, and then we'll look at some application. Okay, so to go back to the, the beginning of the story, uh, in survival analysis, we're concerned with modeling the distribution of the time to a particular event. So for example, uh, death from some disease, uh, release from hospital or a default of a company. And what we're interested in, in doing is modeling the distribution of that time. Um, so the problem here is slightly different from standard kind of density estimation because often we're interested in slightly different kinds of quantities. Um, so one quantity is the survival function that's S of T, so that's the probability that the time we're interested in, capital T, is greater than T. Uh, so that's uh, one minus the distribution function. And people are also interested in the hazard function. Uh, so the hazard function is given by this ratio here, and that's interpreted as the probability of uh, the event happening instantaneously after time T. Uh, so it gives us some idea of that, that probability there. And the hazard plays a, a key role often in a lot of uh, survival analysis. So the reason that survival analysis is kind of interesting, uh, or one reason, is that we don't observe uh, all the times we have some kind of sensory. Uh, so all we observe is that an event happens, often we have right censoring, so we observe that the event happens sometime in the future, but we don't know when. Um, so there's lots of ways to analyze this kind of data. Um, so you can either assume a parametric model for the distribution, or there's a lot of work on non-parametric uh, modeling. So that's mostly uh, frequentist non-parametric modeling. Uh, so for example, uh, there's kind of well-known estimators such as uh, the Kaplan-Meier estimator. Uh, that's familiar from um, undergraduate survival analysis courses. Here we're going to be interested in thinking about uh, regression models and there's really two main ways to build regression models in survival analysis. Uh, one is through proportional hazard models uh, starting from Cox and so in proportional hazard models we assume that we can write the hazard uh, for a particular set of covariates in terms of uh, a product of uh, one term which just depends on time so that's lambda naught t and that's the baseline hazard. And then the way that the covariates enter in 
is through uh, this exponential function. So we take this linear predictor x beta and we take the exponential of that and, and that gives us this proportional hazard model and that's how uh, the, the regressors enter into the model by multiplying the hazard by some factor that depends on uh, the regressors. The other kind of main way to uh, model uh, survival analysis with, uh, with regressors is through accelerated failure time models. And, and so that assumes that the effect of the covariates is to change time, the scaling of time. Uh, so that has this effect on the hazard that this exponential term enters in uh, inside the baseline hazard and outside. And perhaps a more familiar way to think about this is in terms of um, looking at this time and then we can model the, the log time. So we can model the log of the, the time to the event in terms of this linear predictor plus uh, the log of some baseline time. So that time comes from kind of the baseline hazard. Uh, so that's kind of a, a convenient structure because suddenly we have a thing that looks like a linear regression in some ways, right? So if we had a, a normal for log t0, we'd have a linear regression model. Um, okay. So that's my very uh, brief introduction to survival analysis, some of the kind of key ideas for the talk today. Uh, so if we think about what people have done in Bayesian non-parametric uh, regression models, uh, then there's been uh, some work. So uh, Kim and Lee proposed a Bayesian uh, Cox regression model. Uh, so this model isn't quite the Cox proportional hazard, um, and it's gonna, but, it, but it's kind of an important model and it's gonna be the basis for what we're going to be working on. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that model uh, a little bit later in the talk. Uh, quite a well-known model is the model by uh, Maria Diorio and co-authors, uh, where what they do is to model the log survival times. So they work in this accelerated failure time framework. They model the log of survival times using a linear dependent de Richelieu process. Um, and so that gives them a way to kind of uh, have flexibility in terms of the distribution, but also allow the way that the covariates enter into that um, to, uh, to, to um, well, they allow the covariates to enter into that. There's also some work by uh, Fernandez and Tay. Uh, so they model the hazard as a logistic transform of a sum of Gaussian processes. Uh, so that's quite different from the approach that we'll be looking at here. So I'm not going to uh, uh, stay with that. There's, there's also been some kind of uh, recent work uh, looking at these types of models. Um, so race and Pennell use a Dirichlet process mixture of regressions. Uh, and so they, they work in a slightly different framework to the, the two that I've described. So they work in what's called the first hitting time framework. And so that leads them to having a, a Dirichlet process mixture of regressions where the kernels are gonna be inverse Gaussians. Um, so there's been kind of some work in this kind of framework and it seems to be a kind of growing interest in this for time to event. Um, and also recently uh, there's some work by Kamalengi uh, and, uh, and co-authors which build a, a non-parametric model for group data and they use a, a mixture hazard driven by a hierarchical random measure. So that, that builds on uh, recent work of uh, Federico on these hierarchical random measures and deriving properties of those. Um, and so they, they suggest an extension to regression uh, where they build a kind of Cox regression version. So they're, they're working directly on the hazard. Okay, so uh, these models, uh, in, in our opinion, have some kind of weaknesses. Um, so in the Kim and Lee kind of work, then, uh, and also in this Kamalengi work, uh, it's assumed that there's proportional hazards and that uh, regressors enter linearly. Uh, so that's a, a restriction in terms of flexible modeling. In terms of the other proposals, uh, so Diorio et al, Fernandez et al, and Race and Pennell, um, their approaches uh, often it's hard to derive results. Uh, so these are not particularly tractable. Uh, so we can make progress computationally uh, using MCMC. But if we want something that's uh, more tractable, uh, then it's difficult to work with these kinds of processes. 
So what we would like to, to build is a model that has non-proportional hazards, has some kind of flexible dependence on covariates, but which is also tractable uh, and for which we can uh, integrate bits out and, and make a more efficient kind of inference. Okay, so our model is gonna be based around completely uh, random measures. Uh, so I guess for most people here, they're very familiar with completely random measures. So what we imagine is that we have uh, a measure that we can express in terms of the infinite sum uh, of jumps. And so we have jump locations and we have jump sizes. Um, and so the useful thing about these types of uh, processes is that we can represent or we can describe them through the levy kinchin representation. Uh, and so the key thing there is this measure nu, which appears in the exponent, and, and that's the levy, uh, levy intensity, which is going to uh, describe how our, our process kind of works. So it describes where our jump locations are going to be, and also the kind of jump sizes. Uh, so you can think of this, if you're not uh, familiar with completely random measures, as kind of the limit of a compound Poisson process as the jumps of the compound Poisson process, uh, the number of, of jumps goes to infinity, um, but the jump sizes uh, go to, um, well, they kind of uh, have, a, have uh, more mass uh, accumulating very close to zero. Uh, so here's an example of a, a completely, a draw of a completely random measure. So here we have the jump locations coming from a uniform and then the jump sizes uh, come from a gamma process. So, so here we're just showing the largest jumps. Uh, so all the rest of the jumps, this infinitely many other jumps, are going to be smaller than the smallest jump here. So they're going to be uh, very small. Okay, so that's uh, about completely uh, random measures. We're going to be interested in looking at the gamma process. Um, and so the gamma process has this levy intensity here. And so the part at the front looks a, bit, a little bit like a, a gamma density except that the power of s here is minus one. Uh, so if we had uh, a density, then we'd have to have something uh, which is bigger than minus one. So, so these things are not integrable, and, and that's important in terms of their properties. The other important property in terms of uh, inference for us is that the Laplace exponent is available analytically. Um, so for some classes of uh, of completely random measures, we can derive that. And that has this form here on the, uh, on the bottom of the slide. Okay, so that's about completely random measures. The way that we're going to do survival analysis is in terms of neutral to the right distributions. So this is the definition of a neutral to the right process. So here we're interested in this survival function, ST, uh, and the way we're going to model ST is to have e to the minus um, mu naught to t, uh, and that's going to give us S of t. So we're just going to take a transformation of a mu, where mu comes from a completely random measure, and that's going to give us our, our process. Um, so these are important because they're conjugate for right censored data. So going back to the work of Doxum, uh, and also uh, work by uh, Lijue, Prunster, and Walker. Um, they, they look at this for right centered data, and it allows us to evaluate the likelihood and the posterior mean survival uh, in terms of this Laplace exponent. Uh, so that's a, that's a nice property. It makes them nicely tractable. So this is an example of a, a neutral to the right process. So on the left hand side, I have my completely random measure. Uh, so this is it. In fact, this is the completely random measure that I showed you before. It's just that rather than point, just rather than plotting the jumps uh, for each location, here I've taken the integral of all those jumps um, from zero up to the point t, and so that gives me this increasing function that I see on the left-hand side. So that's just the integral uh, of all those jumps on some on some interval. And then on the right hand side, I have my neutral to the right distribution. So that's just e to the minus this process on the left. So I get this uh, uh, non-increasing uh, non function uh, on the right hand side 
and um, that's going to kind of uh, go down to some value close to zero. Okay, so that's the neutral to the right process. Um, now, before I mentioned about the uh, model of Kim and Lee, uh, so they proposed this as a proportional hazards model. Uh, so we want now want to model the survival function uh, uh, to depend on the regressors. And the way that they do that is by introducing this e to the x beta uh, term uh, in front of um, the completely random measure mu. So that allows this completely random measure to be scaled in some way that depends on um, the regressors. Okay, so what they do, what they're able to do then is to prove various properties about this model uh, in terms of um, in terms of the kind of um, posterior properties of the model. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of extend this framework in various ways to make it more flexible. Uh, so this is our, going to be our proposed model. Um, so I'm just going to kind of introduce it and then I'm going to talk about some uh, components of the model and then go back to um, back to looking at the properties. Uh, so hopefully Alan will be here to talk about the properties. Uh, so this is our proposal. Um, so what we're going to have in the exponent is rather than having a single random measure, we're going to have D random measures. So mu one up to mu D. And then rather than having this exponential term uh, outside scaling the, the mu, we're just going to have a general function FJ. And that's going to be some function of our regressors uh, and also of parameters beta. Okay, so that's going to give us a very general kind of framework. Um, so uh, mu is going to be uh, a vector of completely random measures. And I'll come on to, to talk about how we can model that vector. And then fj are going to be these parameterized functions of x, uh, where beta are the parameters. So the reason that we wanted to call this a uh, generalized additive neutral to the right is that we have the neutral to the right structure. But also, we kind of have the look of a generalized additive model in some ways, in terms of uh, adding together lots of different functions of x. Uh, so that gives us a very general kind of uh, framework. OK, so the thing that's probably, uh, so in terms of f, uh, we could choose kind of splines or any kind of basis function or any kind of function we want to think about uh, to put in there or, or something, um, something that's multivariate and so on. Uh, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the vector of completely random measures and how we're going to specify that. So in the vector of completely random measures, uh, we're going to generalize the idea that we had before of completely random measure to have for each location, we now have different jumps for different dimensions. So our, our processes are linked because they have the same locations, but for each of the different dimensions, we're gonna have different jump sizes. And we can write that down in terms of this multivariate generalization of the Laplace exponent. And then we have a new is now a multivariate Levy intensity. So that tells us something about the joint distribution of all these jump sizes for each of the locations and tells us something about where the locations uh, are likely to be. So that's the vector of completely random measures. And there's various ways that you can go about constructing those. Uh, so one way is through additive processes. That is, you kind of build them by having uh, a kind of common component, a common random measure mu naught, uh, and idiosyncratic uh, random measures. Uh, and so that idea has been uh, quite widely studied. I mean, even before the references here, in terms of uh, work of uh, Muller and Rosner uh, and so on. So that kind of builds us a, a fairly simple kind of dependence. Uh, something a bit more sophisticated is the Levy copula. So a Levy copula is uh, kind of like a parametric copula that we're familiar with, uh, uh, or maybe people are familiar with uh, from uh, other parts of statistics. The thing that we have is you kind of have the same idea that we want to separate out the marginal from uh, the joint, from the kind of dependence. Uh, but here, rather than having marginal distributions, 
because we're interested in uh, vectors of completely random measures, we're going to have marginal completely random measures. So we assume that those, have, those are fixed and those are the same for each dimension. And then we have some way of writing down a levy copula. Uh, and that gives us this dependent structure. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a nice idea, but it, in practice, it's kind of quite difficult to, uh, to work with. Uh, and that's why, in a way, these things haven't really uh, taken off uh, in Bayesian non-parametrics, I think it's fair to say. And, and one problem is that the uh, Laplace exponent is often not available uh, explicitly. Um, okay, so the way that we're going to do it is in terms of uh, compound random measures. So in compound random measures, we build this uh, vector of completely random measures uh, by defining a multivariate levy intensity of this form here. Uh, so we have uh, two parts, really. Um, so we have our, our jumps um, and they're going to be described by a score distribution. So the score distribution is parametric. That's a, multi, that's a kind of multivariate distribution. And we assume that has density H. Um, so you could define it without density uh, with respect to Lebesgue measure. Uh, but here we're just going to kind of think of it in those terms. And nu star is what we call um, a levy, a directing levy uh, intensity. So it's a levy intensity of a directing levy process. Um, Okay, so that's kind of the definition is a little bit, um, a little bit uh, unclear in some ways, I always think. But what's a kind of a clear way to understand it is in terms of this representation here. So the way that we can represent this, uh, so now we have a form that's kind of familiar from writing down completely random measures. So uh, mu j is going to be the sum of an infinite number of jumps. Um, and so what's different here is before we had ji times delta yi, uh, but now in front of the ji's we have an mji. Uh, and so what that does is to take each of our jumps. So we, if we look at the i jump in, in our series, then for each of the different dimensions of our random measure, we're going to get a different value of mu ji. And what that's going to do is that's going to multiply ji by different levels mji. So that's going to lead us to perturb our jump uh, by, a, by a random amount in each of the dimensions. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice idea. And one of, one, of the nice, uh, one of the nice aspects is that we separate out the non-parametric part, which really comes through the, the, this directing levy measure, the ji and the delta, and the delta yi part. And then the dependence. Uh, is modeled through these MJIs. Uh, so this gives us a, a, an alternative way to, to build um, vectors of completely random measures. One nice property is that um, we can write the uh, multivariate Laplace exponent of a corm in a kind of nice way. Uh, so that's kind of one of the attractions of this type of process. So we can write it as an expectation of the uh, Laplace exponent of the directing levy intensity. Uh, so that's kind of a, a nice kind of property um, because then uh, if we have an analytical form for the Laplace exponent of the directing levy intensity, then we're left with just doing an expectation with respect to the score distribution. And so in certain cases, we can do that analytically or we can come up with ways to approximate it. Uh, so here's an example of the, the idea. Uh, so at the top, I have the directing levy process. And then I have three different random measures for these different dimensions of the vector of completely random measures. And then the jumps have um, different sizes, uh, which have come from this modulation by the scores. So it gives us a way to build these kind of correlated uh, measures. Okay, so is, is Alan there? I don't think so. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll just plug on then. Uh, I haven't heard back from Alan. Um, okay, so I shall carry on. Uh, okay, so that's our, that's our kind of proposal. 
for this uh, vector of completely random measures to use these uh, compound random measures. So just to go back to the, the model that we're interested in, then our model is going to have this form here. So the survival function is going to be e to the minus this uh, sum of each of these components of the vector of completely random measures, where each of those gets scaled by some uh, function. Uh, so I'm also going to introduce some notation C. So C is going to be a generic kind of uh, name for the parameters of the vector of completely random measures. So that could be uh, the intensity function of the intensity part of the, the gamma process, or if we had something more complicated than a gamma process, like a generalized gamma process, for example, then we would have some parameters and, and they would be part of C. So it's just any parameters that we have um, that are associated with our completely random measures. Okay, so in terms of thinking about the properties of this, uh, this Ganter model, then the first thing is that if we think about the distribution for each observation, then that's going to be uh, neutral to the right and the neutral to the right kind of parameter, this, this uh, random measure that we use in the neutral to the right is gonna have this additive form here. An important thing to, to note is that the model allows for non-proportional hazards. So if we look at the difference of the survival function at two uh, regressor values, then uh, we get this form here, and we can see that we've uh, moved away from proportional hazards. We also have um, some recently, or not, maybe not so recently, anyway, so, some, uh, we have some models that live within this class. So, uh, if we go back to the, the Kim and Lee model, then that's obviously uh, returns when D equals one. So when we have one random measure and we choose our function to be uh, an exponential. And also if we think about multiple sample models, um, so there's been some work on multiple sample neutral to the right models, then we can get those types of models um, by assuming that these functions are indicator functions uh, that indicate so we have one function for each of the different groups. And so then that leads us to having uh, a, each of these completely random measures for, uh, for each of the dimensions. Okay, so there's some of the properties. Uh, another nice aspect of this uh, Ganter type uh, approach is that we have a competing risk interpretation. So if we think about there being uh, D different risks, and we assume that the survival function for the Jth risk has this form here. So this is the form of the, the kind of, uh, well, it's, it's similar to the Kim and Lee model, uh, just that we have this function fj, which is general. Then we can think about those as each as an unobserved latent risk. Um, and so- Sorry, right. Jim, uh, Alan is here. So I don't know if you want- Yeah, to yeah, Alan should take over there. Okay, okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, Hi, hello. Um, let me just. Yeah, so uh, we were here, no, in the competing risk inter interpretation. Can you hear me well? It's uh... yeah, yeah, that's where we got to. Yeah. Okay. So um, a nice property of the Gantry model is that we have a competing risk interpretation. Um, so here we can think of the latent risks uh, given by the survival function, and we. We think that we only observe the time to death as the minimum of these competing risks. So as usual, when we see the survival function of this uh, minimum, it's gonna coincide with the one of a Gantry model, conditionally on mu and beta, right? So um, this is attractive because uh, when modeling a lot of times, uh, we can have a, co uh, a competing risk setting that is, uh, uh, it can give us a lot of advantage for, for modeling purposes. 
Now uh, I'm going to discuss the we're going I want to discuss the posterior char characterization of our model. For this, uh, we're going to I'm going to introduce some notation. So let T1 through TK be the order survival times uh, without repetitions of, in our survival data. And let IE be the indexes of the uncensored observations. So here we're going to be considering possibly sensor to the right observations. And this set IE is just the set of exactly of, uh, exact observations. So uh, considering the uh, survival data, possibly sensor to the right, we have that the posterior distribution of mu is gonna be given by this quantity where uh, we denote a uh, new circle is gonna be a uh, divided vector of completely random measures uh, with Levy intensity given as follow. Here, uh, remember that in, in our setting we're, we're, being, we're being multivariate. So here uh, in the first entry, it, it, this, this entry corresponds to the vector of weights, and this second entry corresponds to the vector of locations. So when the location is restricted to be between the j minus one uh, order survival time without repetition and the j order survival time without repetition, we are gonna have this Levy intensity. Where we observe that we have this factor depending on these quantities uh, h, h tilde, this H tilde are going to be the analog of the number of risk patients, which is a quantity that is very common in survival analysis. So here, this H tilde, H tilde, they are the analogs of that, and they are going to be affected by the covariate structure. And we want to highlight that the uh, here we get an exponential tilting of the a priori Levy intensity nu, and here in the nu we don't have the covariate uh, uh, dependence, right? So that's a, that's a convenience in the in the Gantru model, because if we had, for example, introduced covariate uh, dependence structure a priori in the in the low intensity nu, then uh, in the posterior uh, we would probably have uh, we wouldn't have this decoupling of having a factor where we just we have the covariate uh, appearing and then having the a priori low intensity without the covariate, no? we will also get the, uh, a covariate effect in the tilting. So we actually like this uh, decoupling and we like this uh, exponential tilting of a uh, Levy intensity, which again is something that happens in a lot of Bayesian non-parametric models and allows for tractability, having in the posterior an exponential tilting. On the other hand, uh, this second part in the posterior is uh, our fixed location part. So here the locations are given by the set IE, which are our exact observations, the ones that are not censored to the right. And uh, we're gonna get a vector of random weights for which each one of these exact, exact observations. This vector of random jumps is gonna be determined by its uh, probability density function, which is given as follow by this equation. And here, uh, I also want to highlight again that here this new prime this has to do with a partial derivative of our a priori Levy intensity. So again, in this, in this uh, part, we're not gonna have a covariate dependence and we get this decoupling that we have the, the covariate dependence separate from the Levy intensity a priori in our posterior quantities, which is uh, again, convenient for tractability of the model. And finally, something uh, to highlight is that this uh, vector of completely random measures, mu circle, is gonna be independent of the random weights M1 through MD, and also indexed by the exact observations. So we can get uh, some corollaries from, this, from the posterior characterization. Firstly, regarding the likelihood, we're gonna be able under mild regularity conditions to get the likelihood of C and beta given the survival data. Where here I remind you that C is the vector of parameters of the a priori Levy intensity and beta is a vector, is the vector of the regression coefficients. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna be able to get uh, the likelihood for these quantities in terms of the Laplace exponent of the a priori Levy intensity mu. So this uh, Laplace exponent really is a, qu a key quantity for um, doing inference in our procedure. So here we needed to uh, make evaluations of our likelihood. And once we can perform evaluations of our likelihood, 
we're going to be able to implement a couple of inferences, inference schemes. For example, we can run either a Markov chain Monte Carlo inference scheme or a maximum a posteriori uh, inference scheme. Finally, we're going to be interested in performing estimation of the of the survival function. And in, thanks to our posterior characterization theorem, we are going to be able to get uh, conditionally on the regression co coefficient beta, we're going to be able to calculate this uh, posterior mean. Where here XR is a covariate related to a new observation, a new patient that we might have. And, and the posterior is with the data, no? And with the covariate and uh, the regression coefficient. So here we're going to be again able to uh, calculate to evaluate this quantity in terms of the Laplace exponent of the a priori Levy intensity new. So again, the, the Laplace exponent of the a priori Levy intensity is key for our procedures. Well, going into the applications part, we, uh, we're gonna be using for the vector of completely random measures, a compound random measure, as Jim discussed. To determine the compound random measure, we are gonna have to make a choice for the score distribution and for the directing Levy measure. In this case, uh, for the score distribution, we are, we are going to choose a mixture of log normal distributions. Here, these log normal distributions are going to be in R plus uh, to the V. And um, these log normals are going to be related to a Gaussian with mean given by this term, one minus delta times EI plus delta one, where each EI is just the canonical basis in RD. And this one is just the vector of ones in RD. And the, the Gaussian related to that log normal is also going to have a covariance matri matrix of sigma square times ID, where ID is just the identity matrix of dimension D. So in this construction, uh, when delta goes to zero, the mass is going to be accumulating near the axis in, in R plus to the D. And when delta goes to one, the mass is going to be accumulating on the identity. So uh, this in terms of the vector of completely random measures tells us that when delta is going to zero, the vector of completely random measures is gonna be behaving similarly to having a vector with independent entries. Whereas if delta goes to one, the vector is gonna be behaving as if having entries almost surely equal. In terms of our Gantry model, this would mean that if for example, we condition on the betas and the vector mu, with our latent risk, we would have, uh, when delta goes to zero, we will have independent risks. And when delta goes to one, we will have completely dependent risks in the sense that, uh, that if we know one of the, of the latent risk, then we would know deterministically all the other risks, though conditionally to beat and mu. And regarding the directing levy measure for the corm, we are gonna be choosing a gamma process as the one um, Jim discussed. And with, with those choices, we are gonna, first, we are gonna explore a simulation study. Here we are gonna be considering wavelength random variables with shape K and, uh, and scale lambda. And we're gonna be considering three latent risks. One of our risk, let's call it the risk zero, which is gonna be a shared risk. And then we're gonna have a risk one and risk two. They are gonna be idiosyncratic risks. We're going to have a covariate, we're doing regression, we're going to have a covariate that is going to be normal with mean one and variance 0 0.75. And our observations uh, conditionally on this covariate are going to be such that if the covariate is less or equal to one, then we are going to observe the minimum of the shared latent risk Y0 and the idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic risk Y1. And if the covariate set is greater than one, we are going to be observing the minimum between the shared latent risk Y0, and, the, and in this case, the idiosyncratic risk uh, Y2. So in a sense, we have two subpopulations. Here, um, I, I want to highlight that we also have this parameter lambda, the L, this parameter L is between zero and one. So when L is close to zero, then we have that the scale parameter of the latent risk zero is going to infinity. So this uh, latent risk is gonna be very big. And in this minimum, we are probably just gonna be observing the idiosyncratic risks. Whereas if L goes to one, 
then now the, the scale parameters of the idiosyncratic risks, they are gonna be big and probably we're just gonna be observing realizations from the shared latent risk. No? So, um, so that's the kind of behavior that we are gonna have in this simulation study. And finally, for the um, regression functions of the Gantru, we are gonna be choosing these indicator functions. So we're gonna choose F1 to be the indicator that said the covariate is less or equal to beta. And for F2, we're gonna make an antithetic choice. So it's gonna be uh, this other indica indicator. And uh, so this beta is gonna play uh, the role of a threshold parameter, no? which is uh, coinciding with what we actually have in our simulation study. No? But we have this uh, threshold of one for the populations no? uh, related to the covariate. So for example, here, um, we, here we have plotted the um, curves for the simulation study when L is equal to 0 0.1. So we will have uh, that the survival curves are probably arising from the idiosyncratic risk. And uh, here we observe that, for example, for the covariate set equal to 0.66, we have this uh, true survival, the one that has is dashed with color black. So we have uh, this kind of behavior for this population. And uh, when Z is e uh, greater than one, for example, here with 1.4, for 44, we're gonna have the, the, the true survival is the, the one with the dash purple lines, which is this one under here. And we can see that our uh, Gantro model with the MCMC inference procedure is doing a good job in approximating these uh, survival curves for, the, for these two choices of the covariate. For comparison purposes, we are using the linear dependent Dirichlet process of the Yorian collaborators in 2009. Here for the LDDP, as well as for the Gantro, we are showing uh, um, some credible bands. And for the, uh, and also we are showing the, the, the maximum a posteriori inference procedure for the Gantro, which is also uh, working appropriately. In order to compare our model to LDDP more formally, we calculated the L2 distance between the estimated survival functions and the true survival functions for the previous choice of uh, parameters. But here we are also considering the parameter L when we are close to complete dependence. No? So we are close to having all the, all the survival times arising from the shared latent risk. And we see that, um, that the Gantru um, is, is performing uh, quite well as well the, uh, as, the, as the map, a bit better than the LDDP, which is something that we would expect as, as, as in this uh, simulation study, we have uh, a competing risk um, formulation. So for uh, modeling this, this data uh, using the Gantru that has a competing risk interpretation, is, is, it must have some payoff, no? which here we see as the increasement in the performance of the fitting. No? We consider a melanoma study with 205 patients who had a tumor removed, removed by surgery. And there we, well, um, it is very intuitive to think that uh, if you have a very big tumor, then the, the, risk, the risk that you will have is gonna be different than the risk that you will have if you have a small tumor. So uh, in the Gantry model here, we are gonna induce uh, a regression model and um, exploiting that structure no? in the covariate of the, of the tumor. So here we chose for F1, uh, this regression, the maximum between zero and the minimum of one and this function L beta z that is gonna be depending on some Lagrange interpolators. And then F2, that is the maximum of zero, one minus the maximum of one and the, the Lagrange interpolator that we had previously. So this F2 is again, kind of an antithetic version of F1. Uh, where, uh, well, where these Lagrange interpolator polynomials, they're just gonna kind of function as a, a, black, box, a black box to get the flexibility to try to learn the different populations uh, with respect to the covariate that we could infer as previously in our Gantry model. So here uh, the nodes or nodes of the, of the Lagrange interpolator are gonna be given by the five number summary of the observed tumor thickness. So just the minimum, the maximum, the lower upper quantile and the median. 
And here uh, we calculated the, our beta map, maximum, the maximum posteriori beta. And here we see the, how the regression functions look. So for example, we can see that if we have a covariate, the red points are sextile. So if we have a covariate that is between the second and third sextile of the data, uh, atomorphicness that is in those values, then uh, in the gantry, we are gonna have all the effect given by the that by mu one, the first entry of our vector of completely random measures. And the second vector of completely random measures is gonna be weighted by F2, is gonna be zero. So we're gonna have no contribution by mu two. So in a way we see that here, uh, this antithetic construction of the regression functions is kind of telling us when, uh, which entry of the vector of completely random measure is kind of dominating in our survival. And so that's why we highlight this point of intersection, 3.3984, as, as the point where previously we have that for tumor thickness below, below that threshold, the mu one is contributing more and later on mu two is contrib uh, contributing more. And when we get close to the fifth sextile, we see that all the contribution now is given by, by mu two. Here uh, also we estimated by maximum posteriority the parameter delta, which was relating to this thing of the independence and the complete dependence. So here, because it's very close to zero, is indicative of, of the model learning that the, that the, the populations given by these regressions functions are gonna be taken as independent and not as having too much borrowing of information. So this is just two subpopulations defined by the threshold tumor thickness uh, being lower than this value or greater than this value. So here we see the, the fits that we get. So here, for example, we consider a, a covariate of Z equal 1.5. So that's below the threshold that we learn. And also Z equal 3.4, which is just above the threshold. And then a value of tumor thickness of 6.1, which is a very big tumor for this data, uh, tumor size for this data set. Uh, sorry. So here uh, we are also comparing with uh, Kaplan measures uh, that we calculated uh, in some covariate windows. So for example, uh, to compare with the covariate 1.5, we calculated ca the Kaplan measure of the observations that have a covariate uh, tumor size between 1.255 and 1.75. And uh, for example, uh, later on we consider a window between 2.7 and 4.1 for the covariate and then between 4.1 and 8.1. No? So those values are kind of containing here the point estimates that we calculated for, that we fitted for the Gantru as well as for the LDDP. We see that the Gantru is the Kaplan Mayer window estimates. And we observe that uh, the, the LDDP might be, we, we could say that it might be doing a bit too much of smoothing and also the fit of the tails is not, uh, it can be a bit, uh, a bit, uh, not what we want, no? it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit, uh, we, we don't have a very good uh, fit in the tails, right? It's, it's decreasing too much too rapidly. No. And um, so uh, in summary, we have the, the generalized additive neutral to right regression model is a flexible and it's a tractable model. Uh, it can be interpreted in terms of latent computing risk, which is really useful to determine uh, uh, the regression functions in a sensible way in order to model our data. And um, it can provide better fits than competing Bayesian non parametric regression models, especially when we can explore this competing risk uh, structure that we have for our a uh, Gantru model. So uh, that would be uh, all. Many thanks uh, for the invitation and for your attendance. Okay, well, uh, let's thank Jim and Adam for their presentation. Uh, so we have some time for questions. So are there any questions or comments for Jim and Alan? And if so, please turn on your mic and go ahead and write the question in the in the chat. I have a small question. Uh, in the generalized additive additive neutral to the right regression model, uh, back on page twenty nine when you introduced it, 
you had these functions f sub j. And Jim at that time commented that those functions could be splines or, or very flexible uh, families. Uh, usually when I think of the additive model, I think of using the backfitting algorithm to estimate the f sub j's and the f sub j's are fully non-parametric. Uh, here, it didn't look like you had that much flexibility. Did I misunderstand? Um, so I think um, I think we haven't really explored that. So I think the way that we've used it at the moment is in terms of kind of basis functions for FJ. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the way that we envisage using it is um, to investigate having more flexible forms uh, for FJ. So Gaussian processes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a, a direction that we kind of need to explore, really. So that's at the moment we kind of used fairly. Um, simple kinds of functions mm -hmm. uh, Alan kind of demonstrated. So that's, uh, and that, that's working well. So I think it's like the next step really to, uh, to go to something more sophisticated. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other question? Um, I have one. Um, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I have a curiosity about the uh, the, the form, the marginal distribution of the, uh, of the completely random measures involved. Um, if I understood well, you focused on the, on the gamma process. And, 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 my, and my question is, um, how much do you think all the method is, um, is sensitive with respect uh, either the parameters of the gamma process, either choosing a different marginal distribution for the completely random measure. Um, do you think that it could make a big difference in terms of posterior inference? Well, the the choice that we made for the of using a gamma completely random measure was because. Um, well, the neutral derivative has been thoroughly studied, and for example, um, and it's one of the examples you know, where we know that if you don't choose carefully the the completely random measure that you're using, you might not have consistency, or you might not have a bursting but misses theory where you have an optimal rate of convergence. So we use the gamma because it is a, it, it it has the the the, the bursting but misses um, result for the neutral to the right. So, um, and also um, here with our com construction, uh, it's not affecting that much. So we are not, uh, we're actually not break the, breaking the bursting but misses theorem if we were to look at it uh, marginally. So that's the main reason why we use the, the gamma. Um, okay, thank you very much. That. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yeah, I might have a question about also about the, the functions f. So yeah, at the beginning, I thought that you were going to use a kind of a spline there. But then I noticed that you are using these like very specific type of functions. Uh, I think that you have a sort of identifiability there. I mean, let's say my question is, uh, would you like to, to have some sort of identifiability condition uh, for this f? functions so you can kind of interpret them or is not something that maybe is important here yes actually um, yeah we can have a kind of like um, identifiability issue no because here for example the the, uh, the examples we presented they were kind of, we were showcasing these antithetic uh, regression mm -hmm. functions so we could have like a, a change in the labels right so that could be a bit of a so that we can have identifiability issues there. And actually what we did to surpass that was to fix one of the nodes. So we fixed one of the nodes to have one of the F1s be positive for certain, for the first quantile. No, so that's gonna be, for example, that helps you to impose identifiability. No? So F1 is gonna be corresponding to the, to the cobalt in, in, in our tumor uh, example, is gonna be corresponding to the small tumor sizes, right? So yes, uh, we use the, kind of like explains those Lag uh, Lagrange interpolators. And we had to choose a bit carefully the, the, the nodes in order to impose some identifiability constraints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we talk about that in the paper, actually. Um, 
So we talk about ways that you can maybe um, think about the model in a kind of more identified way, mm -hmm. relating it to proportional hazards and seeing how far away you are from proportional hazards. Um, but yeah, and potentially we can also do it through the Muse, uh, mm -hmm. try and identify it that way. Um, but yeah, yeah, so we talk a bit more about that actually in the paper. Okay. Uh, any other question? Well, if not, let's thank to Jim and Alan again for the presentation. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Let's stop.